First, let me give you a little bit of background on who I am. I'm Dr. Nick Begich. I'm a uh, author and lecturer. I have a doctorate in traditional and complementary medicines. I was born and raised and spent most of my life here in Alaska. I also work as the executive director for the Lay Institute on Technologies based in Dallas, Texas. Um, its main mission is to educate the public on the impacts um, and repercussions of technology so that we can be prepared uh, in this century. The first topic today that we want to cover is updates on the HARP story, the high frequency active auroral research project, which many people are familiar with. This, this project initially was a joint effort of the Air Force and Navy to build large radio transmitters here in Alaska. These transmitters would occupy a huge area. Initially, it was 48 antenna in the array. These are antennas that are 72 feet tall, have a cross dipole, so across the top you'll see this uh, type of a shape. These are about 70 feet across. Uh, there's 48 in the array. Um, eventually, at the end of this coming summer, summer of 2005, we'll be seeing 180 antenna in the array, and eventually the full array will be 360 antenna. The idea between these um, radio frequency generators is to focus radio frequency energy in a much different way uh, than, than most of us think about radio frequency energy uh, coming off of an antenna, if we think of it at all. But when you think about it, when you go back to the original companies that started this project, it was a company called Arco Power Technologies, Inc., which was a subsidiary of Atlantic Richfield, one of the largest oil and gas companies at that time operating in Alaska. They sold that subsidiary to E-Systems, which is a military um, contractor, a large military contractor based in Washington, D.C., who later sold it to Raytheon, who later sold it um, to uh, British Aerospace, which now controls uh, that technology. But in the course of that, one of the things that they had talked about was what's called earth-penetrating tomography. This is the idea of sending a signal up into the ionosphere, uh, oscillating that signal off the ionosphere, which actually causes that layer 30 miles above the Earth's surface to begin to vibrate in harmony with the signal on the ground, causing it to act as a giant broadcast antenna, sending that signal back down to the Earth, uh, and it passes through the Earth and see in the form of an ELF, an extremely low frequency signal, a very long wavelength that efficiently passes through the Earth, um, and that can be used for a number of things, including Earth penetrating tomography, the idea of looking into the Earth, or in plain language, it would be like, um, by comparison, X-raying the Earth or looking into the Earth for underground mineral layers, underground shelters, nuclear facilities, uh, and the like. Brooks' concern was much broader um, in terms of what could be triggered with Earth penetrating tomography. And one of the things that he noted was the effect of resonance, this idea of sending energy in, it harmonizes in a way that causes the energy actually to be more than the sum of the total. You know, it's like the um, old World War I stories where the armies were marching across wooden bridges in Europe and some hours after they had marched across, the bridges would just collapse. And it was the rhythmic um, beat of the march across that bridge that set up um, essentially a vibration that eventually collapsed the entire uh, structure. This idea of resonance when applied to earth penetrating tomography at very high power levels causes concern for many scientists, including Brooks Agnew, because what he believes is possible is to trigger um, events uh, within the earth, geophysical events, earthquake, volcanic eruptions, the kinds of things that may already be on the edge of discharge and with the right resonant energies added into the system cause them to overload and actually fracture. In fact, it was William Cohen that actually uh, made the statement um, regarding uh, uh, wep weapons of mass destruction and the idea of generating earthquakes artificially. Weapons of mass destruction and the idea of generating earthquakes artificially. Weapons of mass destruction and the idea of generating earthquakes artificially. The blueprint for HARP, High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program. What does HARP do? HARP is, uh, is a large antenna where we beam radio frequency energy up into the upper atmosphere and we create on a small scale what the sun normally does. The assignment came that the Navy and the Air Force were to manage the program. There were some other ideas both to possibly modify weather. In 1983 I did radio tomography with 30 watts looking for oil in the ground. I found 26 oil wells over a nine-state area, 
and 100% of the time was accurate with just 30 watts of power beaming straight into solid rock. HARP uses a billion watts beam straight into the ionosphere for experiments. Picture these strings on the piano as layers of the earth. Each one has its own frequency. What we used to do is beam radio waves into the ground and it would vibrate any strings that were present in the ground. We might get a sound back like and we'd say that's natural gas. We might get a sound back like and we'd say that's crude oil. We were able to identify each frequency. We accomplished this with just 30 watts of radio power. If you do this with 2 billion watts, the vibrations are so violent that the entire piano would shake. In fact, the whole house would shake. In fact, the vibrations could be so severe underground that could even cause an earthquake. Nikolai Tesla was an eccentric genius and was widely seen as, as the great rival to Thomas Edison. Around 1891, Tesla invented the type of towering transformer coils still in use today to generate high voltage currents for studying electricity. It was Tesla who developed alternating current, the electrical current that we use to power our homes and appliances. It was also Tesla who put man on his quest to control the weather. He developed a chilling theory for controlling the weather using extremely low frequency waves, or ELF waves. If you've been to a rock concert and felt the low frequency vibrations of the music pounding from the speakers, ELF waves are similar to that. ELF waves are low-level electrical currents that are discarded from electrical power lines, electrical wirings in our homes, even electrical equipment in our cars. These are normally emitted at levels so low that they won't harm you. Tesla theorized that if ELF waves could be beamed into the ionosphere, in the upper reaches of the atmosphere, man could change the course of weather. The ELF waves would create heat, altering the molecular structure of the ionosphere, pushing it out into space. When you heat a certain region of the ionosphere, it literally pushes it up and creates what would look like a column of space, and the lower atmosphere then rushes in to fill that space, and as it does, it changes the flow of jet streams within the region, pressure systems, and in that respect, it could manipulate weather. What this means is the heated ionosphere acts like a giant dam, rerouting the path of the jet stream. The jet stream flows between six and nine miles above the Earth's surface and reaches speeds up to 300 miles per hour. The jet stream is a, is a focused, high-velocity rope of air that moves billions of gallons of water around our world, like a giant river uh, at uh, 50, 60,000 feet up. It moves all the water around our world for rain, for storms. This is the lifeblood of planet Earth. Could Tesla's theories help create a new generation of covert weather weapons? It was the Russians that were creating this signal. Perhaps it's already here. <laughs> 